my title is a little different than what I gave uh, in the sheet which advertises the day because I was thinking that about um, sort of the whole day uh, sort of interesting to think about it as how very basic science kind of research that was done in a very theoretical setting uh, maybe 30, 40 years before uh, it, people saw the application of it comes to fruition and uh, so sort of from basic idea to impact is going to be more the focus of my talk. And uh, so it's going to be kind of a survey of a bunch of things that we've seen here, but sort of from a point of view of how it went from um, an invention early on to, to usage today. And I'll also talk uh, a little bit about uh, what's being done now in terms of taking some basic technology from the past, some basic ideas, uh, to apply them for problems in machine learning and uh, public and um, in this age of, of big data. Okay, so, uh, and I just want to say that this talk is uh, based uh, to some extent on a talk that I gave uh, in front of Congress, or at least representative of Congress in DC. Uh, it's part of um, an effort of the uh, of, uh, MSRI, Mathematical Science Research Institute, to convince Congress that money should be devoted to basic research because of its importance. So this is a, a, a high-level talk, which I think is good given the, the hour. Uh, so think of yourself as a bunch of uh, people in Congress that don't know a lot of cryptography, but you are willing to learn. Uh, so this, this is the level. So I apologize that it's not uh, talking about anything technical like lattices or what do you call them, CPRs? What, what's that? Those PCRs. PCRs. OK. <laughs> what? All right. So. Uh, so the beginning of this talk is really the fact that I uh, was a graduate student at Berkeley in the 80s and now is many years later. But uh, in the process of this, I've really been an eyewitness to a lot of uh, very surprising consequences of research that I sort of uh, witnessed firsthand, <coughs> starting from uh, public cryptography, uh, which everybody knows its impact on electronic commerce. If you don't know, it really is behind everything you're doing online these days, uh, transactions like uh, uh, getting things out of your bank accounts, uh, purchases online, and so forth. It's all powered by the belief that people cannot essentially steal your money or uh, pretend to be you when they're making transactions. And then there is cryptocurrencies that people talked about. There's uh, uh, zero knowledge on quantum computations that uh, Tomas talked about uh, as in its basis this idea that um, quantum computers can be built, which again is kind of tremendous that we are at this era where people are actually seriously talking about it. They're seriously talking about changing the whole interface of electronic commerce to one that's going to be quantum resilient. Whereas only I can remember when the sort of finance proposing this idea of a quantum computer, it's all on paper, right? And now we are in this age where we are worried about it. I mean, we're also excited, but also worried about what the impact will be on electronic commerce. And uh, other basic ideas which have nothing to do with cryptography, really things like content distribution using uh, essentially very clever algorithms for distributing content very quickly, like Akamai type algorithms that come from distributed algorithms, which really come from a theoretical inventions of people working on some abstract graphs with some abstract model of, of conflicts and uh, traffic, which they didn't even really imagine could be true, but then it was the case. I think the story of Akamai is that there was a Super Bowl and uh, there's all these people who were trying to advertise and everybody was logging in to see the Super Bowl and everything crashed. And the only uh, the way that this was kind of salvaged is because the people who used Akamai. And that's really what gave them their, um, their leverage in, in going to, to market. But it really was a paper in one of these uh, Fox uh, papers. Fox is a, our theory conference. And then Google, you know, it's based, uh, search on, based on the PageRank algorithm, which again is a a theoretical algorithm to begin with having to do with expander graphs and so forth, but it's made its way to what we use, everybody uses today. And the reason that I have a picture of cloud computing is because, as was mentioned, I think, in uh, maybe in Tomas's talk, is this whole idea that you want to delegate computation to a more powerful computer. Maybe it could be a, a quantum computer, it could be also just a classical computer in the cloud that has a lot more uh, strength. And these days, everybody's saying about putting their computations in the cloud, but there's a basic question there. But how are you assured that the cloud is doing the computations correctly? There's also a question of privacy. How do you make sure that you can harvest the computational power of the cloud without giving all your data away? So the question is, how do you do this efficiently? How do you verify computations in the cloud? How do you make sure uh, that, that privacy is not compromised? And ways to do that efficiently, again, are based on fairly basic complexity type work on proof systems, efficient verification. So 
I really think that all these major, I, I feel safe saying that all these major advances have come about due to basic research. And in some sense, you can think about the next, I guess, 10 minutes. <laughs> we want to get the reception at four, but let's say the next 20 minutes as trying to convince you that this is really true. Maybe it's really going to the convert, but if you, you're a congressman and women, maybe you need to be convinced. So, uh, so what characterizes basic research here? You know, really, this is again uh, something that we all know is that what, in my, in my definition, it's driven by curiosity. It's not because we got a DARPA grant and we have to do deliverables. Uh, and, um, and really, the consequences of it sometimes, you know, they cannot be imagined in, adv in advance. That's not why you're doing it. They're somewhat unimaginable. And I think that if you think about sort of these basic crypto and where they are at, it really is kind of unimaginable how far this has gone. And uh, uh, the bottom line that <laughs> we're trying to do in Congress, and the truth is also for companies supporting research like of the type of the Simons uh, Institute, is that from a very small grant, and uh, a lot of this research was done with some you know, $100,000 investment by NSF, you can um, eventually uh, really get to uh, multi-billion dollar, dollar in industries. And these are you know, kind of uh, remarks that usually I dislike. But they're true in the case <laughs> that we're talking about. Um, all right. So what are the type of, uh, so I, you know, there are many fields one could discuss. What I know about is cryptography. And if I could, there's lots of stories one can tell. But here are sort of five stories, publicly cryptography, uh, zero knowledge proofs you've heard about. So these were inv invented in the 80s. And it was a much, uh, I think, only now, and I'll talk about this in more detail in the talk, you're seeing how they are uh, really being taken advantage of in, in blockchains like, uh, like uh, Ali talked about, a private delegation to the cloud in forensics. This is not really being used, but you can at least see, according to Ben's talk, the, the use of it. Uh, a post quantum cryptography, a, and uh, which uh, actually Daniel actually touched on, and other people, that some of the assumptions that we're using these days are resistant to cryptography, uh, to, uh, to quantum <coughs> strength, blockchains, and something we didn't touch about, which is how to do multi party computation. So the point of this slide, really, is that here are five uh, inventions, OK, which have started really without any connection to practice. In fact, they've started so many years ago, maybe 30, 40 years ago. But today, people are talking about this pragmatically as if this is going to enable something that we don't know how to do, and, uh, and they're building these systems. So uh, you know, it's a, I think they all come under this, uh, this uh, uh, title of the talk, which is Idea to Impact, Coming of Age. And I'll tell you a little bit about each one of them, but really a little bit. And um, I guess the, the second thing I want to say is that even though uh, we're sitting here, it's 2019, and each of, of, of these talks is isolated from each other, having, got, having seen this from the get-go, there's really a narrative, there's sort of a story how these things build upon each other. And uh, I like stories, so uh, I'm going to tell this as a story. <laughs> um, OK, so we, uh, uh, and the story starts really, in the most basic uh, story is that uh, and this has nothing to do with uh, <coughs> modern cryptography. But it's always that we think that the basic story of cryptography, there's Alice and Bob, there are two parties, a sender and a receiver. A message wants to be transmitted, but there's somebody that's listening on the line. And the most basic problem of cryptography, right, is that we want uh, to encrypt these messages. And uh, classically, this is done by these Alice and Bob meeting. They decide on a key, and based on the key, they encrypt. And sort of the big uh, departure from this, which starts this whole story of modern cryptography, is this work of uh, Diffie-Hellman. I just want to sort of start the story in the beginning, uh, where they um, really come up with this incredible notion of public cryptography, which starts this whole field off, uh, where they give us this blueprint, this wish list, that there's going to be this way that Alice is going to be able to send uh, messages to Bob without ever meeting him. So they don't have to agree on a key, but somehow there's going to be this magical thing, they hope, okay, of a lock and a key. Right? So there's going to be a public lock, which everyone could send messages and lock by locking their message. But there's only one person, this Bob. Or is it Alice in my Who was sending to whom? Uh, Alice. 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 Alice to Bob. Good. So it's Bob that um, knows the key. So they're saying, wouldn't it be nice if there were this way to lock and a way to open? Uh, so therefore, everybody could send messages to one person who could open them. And in fact, they didn't really. Um, uh, they really didn't have an instantiation of it, but so this is the. Uh, but uh, they, they, uh, 
the first instantiation is this next paper by public uh, by RSA, Rivet Shamir and Adelman in, in uh, MIT, where they say this can be real realized using number theory. And this everybody knows, right? This is the RSA crypto system, where in a sense uh, the lock is uh, some product of, of primes, you know, some large number. Everybody sees this number, and based on that, they can send messages. But only the person who knows the factorization, in a sense, has this uh, analogous key and can open uh, what was locked and read the messages. Okay, so that's the story. It's beautiful. We won't get into details how that's done. But this does really cement this uh, transition of internet from primary military to primary commercial. And if we go back to my first picture, you know, I think that the RSA was based on, a, there was a patent that they wrote. I mean, they had a actually very small grant from NSF, which was intended for something completely different, I think, to do graph algorithms, and they did this. And that's why I think we should ask for money for X, and then we feel completely permitted to do not X or Y, uh, because sometimes, in fact, usually it probably is better than what we set out to do. So these guys, they wrote this patent, and, um, and then really this is emerged to a, a you know, billion dollar industry for certificates and so forth, still being used today on the internet, even though these, this patent is expired. And in terms of how much time it took to go from um, idea to, let's say, patent even, okay, it took a long time. So the idea is like in uh, 1976, I said, 1982, they started the patenting process. It took many, many years till about 2009 that they got a patent for it. Yeah, that's what, of RSA specifically. Okay, so if you look at this, this is from Jim Bitsos and Ron, so it's all, you know, so apparently there was public cryptography, but RSA-based public cryptography takes that much time. It expired in 2009. Yeah, I think it expired. No, not in 2009. No, it cannot be. Uh, yeah. uh, no, not the patent, not the patent, the standard, sorry. Oh, okay. uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I misused the word. So this is standardization. The patent is one thing. The other thing is to ha have it as a standard. So th the process of getting it as a standard took many, many years. It started early. Uh, it took a very long time, a lot of hurdles along the way, and in 2009 it was actually mentioned as a standard. Sorry, you're, I miss, miss, uh, miss it. Uh, and there are lots of uh, explanations of why it's such a long history. Maybe the market wasn't, new, wasn't ready for it, well, there wasn't a killer application, the standard bodies weren't used to this type of uh, standard. But the, my point of this is not so much that you look at these individual boxes, is that it took a very long time to go from basic idea to standard, uh, even though the impact was already done in the middle. Yes? No? Oh, you're looking at the boxes. Okay. <laughs> ah, okay. So meanwhile, in the physics world, which is just, so we're continuing our story, which um, I think uh, Tomas talked about this, is right, is that Feynman is inv inventing this uh, powerful quantum computer on paper, and Peter Shor says, you know what, with your quantum computer that's written on paper, I'm going to factor integers also on paper. And all that's very interesting. It's all on paper. It's all basic research. It's all done in theory papers, in a sense, either physics theory or, or, or computer science theory, because in practice, we know that quantum computers can factor very large numbers, although now I understand we can generate random numbers. I mean, it's a different thing about quantum key distribution, quantum computing. And yet, as, as all, again, I think Tomas uh, talked about, uh, it is now becoming more and more of, uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of money invested in it. And certainly people are worried enough so that they are preparing for this post-quantum age where you can't use factoring and um, because it will be broken. And I thought that Daniela's idea was extremely interesting or, or the person's paper you quoted, which is saying, well, these quantum computers are going to be built at some point, And so we, maybe we can do applications today that are safe against quantum computers that will be built in the future. So somehow base the privacy uh, about some future event, but use it, have it usability in the present. I think I think that's a fascinating idea. So my point here is that we seem to be stuck because there'll be these quantum computers and everything's going to be broken. But uh, as the, as Daniela said, uh, I tie for a completely different purpose because he wanted to he worried about worst case and average case problems and he wanted to show a problem which is hard in the worst case as much as in the average case completely theoretical desiderata desiderata okay which is not uh, motivated by quantum this or that or the other said let, why don't we use geometry those computation those lattices that Daniela described and the problems on lattices like finding a short vector or finding a close vector as a, a sort of a hard problem to solve just like the factoring problems are hard it's another hard problem Right? He says, let's base, uh, let's do that as our basis is of a hard problem. And uh, then it turned out, and this is uh, the book of Daniel and actually I'm on that book too, Complexity of Lattice Problems, where the, uh, so uh, I tell you, just geometry, 
this is very interesting to the theoreticians. And as we theoreticians start playing with it and showing, you know, actually this geometry, it's not a, in the beginning, it looks much less usable than the factoring problem because it's harder. We don't know how to work with vectors and geometry. We know how to work with numbers. But it turns out that actually you can do a lot more with it as far as we can tell. You can do homomorphic encryption. You can do something called functional encryption. It's, uh, it's interesting that it has, seems to have a lot more power than the number th classic number theory. And in addition to that, it has this theoretical basis that motivated Aitai to work on it to begin with. And the third is that it actually seems not to be breakable by quantum computers. Now, that could be because we don't understand these problems well enough. Whatever the reason is, right now, we don't know how to break it, OK? So in some sense, we have gotten quantum resilient, or the way I'd like to say it, we've gotten a solution to a problem that we didn't know we were going to have just because we worried about theory. So people can say, well, this is accidental. But you know, how many accidents can you have? You know, this is how I think about my career. It's all accidents, but at the end, it's not bad. So, so, so um, same here. You know? So from theory, you can solve problems <laughs> that come up in practice later. I would say that's enough evidence to, 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 to do theory. So just I wanted to say one thing. So there'll be something technical here. And it's that uh, Daniele talked about lattices. And he had these geometric pictures. But there's another way to think of it's equivalent to this lattice problems that Daniele talked about. And this is this problem called learning with errors. I think Tomas mentioned this problem. I just wanted to mention what that is. So learning with errors is a problem where you have a secret, which is just a vector of numbers in ZQN. So uh, the numbers are like well, the secret is S1, S2, S3, S4, these n uh, numbers uh, mod q. And, uh, and what you say is what's true about these numbers, what pins them down, is the fact that there's a bunch of equations that these numbers satisfy. Okay? And so what you give everybody in the world to look at is the coefficients of these equations on the right-hand side and also the solutions on the left-hand side. Of course, if you give the exact solution, they could do Gaussian elimination, so you give noisy solutions. And it turns out that if I give you these equations and some, and some noisy solutions, then it's a hard problem to find this S1, S2 up to Sn. This problem is equivalent even though it's very hard to see why, to these problems that Daniela talked about, these geometry problems of finding a short vector or a close vector. Equivalent in some formal sense, okay? That if you can solve one, then you can solve the other, and it's if and only if. By the way, how noisy? Like, how noisy? So how noisy is important, right? It, uh, you, take some you sample some Gaussian noise and you add to it. How noisy depends really on the kind of approximation factor. Uh, Typically, this to be square root of n, where n is the number of coordinates. Right. So, so a little bit depends on the approximation. If, if you, you could ask two questions, how noisy for the purpose of cryptography and how noisy for the purpose of reduction with the geometry. But let's say the square root of n is for the purpose you are interested in for cryptography. Uh, and this is, why is this better than number theory? I don't say it's better, but for right now, we don't know how to break it with quantum computers. Secondly, the best algorithm we know is actually a much classical one, is much uh, slower than the one to factor. And slower is good in our world, because slower for the adversary, which sort of means that you can use smaller numbers rather than larger numbers, since it and it's, uh, takes more time in the size of your dimension. Uh, so there's a lot of advantage to this kind of problem. And this is what this post-quantum, or at least currently, post-quantum, which is an interesting uh, <laughs> way to define it, Qu currently quantum resilient uh, cryptography is based on. Um, so again, the punchline is the basic research from 20, 30 years ago is going to save us from a problem we never knew we'd have. I already said the punchline. What about this? Uh, the fact that I'm saying that there is um, from impact? So there's been a, a standardization uh, call by this National Institute of Standards. It's already closed by now where they said, we want to do public cryptography, digital signatures, key exchange, all based on this new type of crypto, which quantums can't break. Most of the proposals are based on these lattices of learning with errors and uh, from all over the world. OK, so the next, so this is the story for this. Not exactly in the same order, but zero knowledge then, uh, whereas in the first problem, Alice and Bob wanted to send private messages. Now we're talking about authentication. She wants to prove to him that she's Alice. He's like Amazon. She wants to buy something from him. And, uh, and the fear is that uh, if she sends a password over, right, and Amazon has just now compared her, the locally stored password with her password, the problem is that there's a lot of break-ins, let's say. Might be a problem. There's a lot of break-ins into Amazon. Obviously, in 1986, we didn't think about Amazon and breaking into Amazons, but couched in today's reality, we can think of this as the problem. So the question is, how do you prevent this? How is Amazon going to store? Or Amazon is actually I should talk about Facebook. How is Facebook <laughs> going to store my passwords in such a way that I can be confident that it won't be leaked? You know, it, actually, it's a fabulous example. Um, 
And the answer is, uh, I wouldn't trust them. So, so uh, the question then is, is there a way that Alice can prove to uh, Facebook uh, that she knows the password without ever giving it? So could it be that Facebook actually is not gonna get, a, not gonna hold my passwords and they can still verify it's me? That's really the question. And zero knowledge enables you to prove that you know something, okay, and you are the only one who knows that if you generated your password and then you deposited it in some form, in public form that everybody can look at, other people can't because they don't know the password. So this zero knowledge, of course, has to be the kind that uh, Amazon should be sure that it's me, and furthermore, that maybe somebody who's, uh, if Amazon sees it many times, they still can't tell what my password is and store it, uh, or and anybody watching these messages cannot tell, how, cannot imitate to be me and so forth. And zero knowledge gives you all these properties, and this is uh, this paper with Silvio and, and Charlie Rakoff about the knowledge complexity of interactive proof system. The idea being is somehow that uh, the verifier, Amazon, is going to be able to generate some randomly difficult mathematical challenges. We don't tell you how, but they can generate some random mathematical challenges that only the one who knows the password or knows the secret or knows the proof can solve them. Okay, so if you know the proof, if you're the right person who knows the proof to some theorem or the pass, we think about passwords as proofs to theorems, then you can solve those challenges. And each time you log in, they generate new challenges. You can solve these new challenges. And since they never generate the same challenges, somebody can't just watch it and answer the, question, the answers you answered before. They have to solve new challenges. This is one way to abstract what's happening in zero knowledge. Um, so this enables access authorization without fear of identity theft. But uh, really, a, whereas in 85, when we came out with this, it seemed like identity theft, uh, pointed out by Shamir and Fiat, Fiat and Shamir, uh, and Fege it was good for identity theft. We actually were just talking about theorems and proofs, and we had no idea there was any application here. But uh, they pointed out that this is a way to prevent identity theft. These days, you know, there are things like the nuclear disarmament, at least there are papers written about it. It's not just papers, there's actually grants. There's large grants given to different universities for this nuclear disarmament idea based on zero knowledge. There's this forensic idea, but more concretely, there's zero cash, the cryptocurrency, which is based on this idea of zero knowledge where you're trying to prove is consistency between uh, transfers of accounts, right? That you haven't spent money, uh, or if you have spent it, you can't double spend it and so forth without telling the details of what the transactions are. And not only that, but there's even uh, application now for, for, for surveillance. So if we think about a court system, that it, apparently there's this issue where there's many, many, many surveillance orders that are being uh, awarded these days by federal judges, and there's really no accounting of whether um, uh, how, how, how large a problem this is. There's no accounting of whether uh, you know, these things should actually be, uh, there's some gag orders on these and secrecy orders and they're supposed to be lifted and they don't lift it. The, the whole thing is un really is done without uh, sort of um, any guidance. And you could imagine zero knowledge also playing a role there for accounting of, of the court system that they're actually behaving according to what they're supposed to. All right, so this is again a case where unfortunately we didn't patent, but somebody else is making money on it. So, uh, <laughs> but we could have, so there was a publication and, uh, all right. And in terms of standardization, uh, you know, there was a, a workshop last year and there was a workshop that just ended yesterday, uh, the zero knowledge, uh, zero knowledge proof workshop for getting standardized. So remember we talked about RSA taking such a long time, I think, this is taking even longer, mostly because the people behind it didn't start the standardization of effort for about 30 years, but now that it started, we hope it's not gonna take another um, 15, 19, whatever it was over there, years to, to get accomplished. Um, so just uh, continue with the story. What about these blockchains? So people know this paper, or some of you know this paper of Bitcoin by Satoshi. Uh, people don't know who he is, it also gives I think it's a good idea to write a paper when people don't know who you are because it gives... Uh, we know it's you. <laughs> certainly not me. <laughs> so it, give, it gives romantic uh, <laughs> aspect to this whole thing, who he is or she is, who they are, whatever. At this point, it's a... It's a well, uh, okay, but... Uh, and it seems like a miracle, wow. But there is some history to this. And in fact, there's some sort of a paper that talked about the academic pedigree of it. It, it wasn't born out of nothing. Okay, so there are um, works that have been developed in cryptography years before that make their way into this paper. And what are some of these works? So there is this paper by Dworkin and Orr in 1992, 
where they said, you know, this is the time when people were starting to get spam, spam emails, and uh, you wanted to kind of reduce it. Uh, this is before spam filters were really the way to go. And they said, let's make it so that anybody who sends me a message has to do some work, okay? Uh, some computational work. So it won't be worth for the spammers to do so much work, so, and therefore they won't be sending me messages. So they have, this is where this notion of proof of work came. So pricing via processing or combating junk mail. And Microsoft, uh, essentially, I don't know if they implemented it ever, it never went anywhere. But in Satoshi's, what? Yeah. But it never, but it's not used. Is, it is used? It's never commercialized. It's never commercialized. Yeah. Sorry, so it went somewhere, but it wasn't commercialized. And yet, uh, in, uh, in the Bitcoin paper, that's the idea, right? How, to prove that you, to, to get to post, you do a lot of work. And whoever does more work or is more lucky in the last, if they do exactly the same amount of work, posts. So again, proof of work is kind of the way to arbitrate uh, or the way to uh, incentivize posting properly. Um, so that's the proof of work. That's not enough. There's also the idea of timestamping. So sort of that, you know, the, cur the current uh, work that you are doing is based on, on the past and that you can't change the order of the blocks, right? Because it's all based on, next one is based on the history. And this is sort of timestamping built on what's called Merkle trees it's from 1987 in the paper with Stuart Huber, where he proposed this idea that in the New York Times there will be a hash of everything that was posted before. And if you want to uh, put something in the New York Times or the next day, you have to sort of compute a function on that hash. And that way you won't be able to say, I did it 10 years before, because it, you know, it was only posted 10 years later, the thing you were supposed to compute an hash, hash on. And then as Silvio said, also for his uh, idea, this proof of stake, right, or what did he call um, perf perfect? Um, pure. pure. Pure proofs of stake. Then it's not talking about proofs of work, but he, uh, or, or time stamping, but he's talking, uh, also time stamping is, in some sense is there because he's doing a hash of the whole blockchain, but he's talking a Byzantine agreement. Byzantine agreement, again, this is the bread and butter of distributed computing. There's lots of work from 1982 to build on. So there's a lot of research here that was done completely for different purposes, really for academic study that have made their way into this incredible industry of, of blockchains and micropayments. And even though people say, and Silvio himself said, there's no really blockchain. I mean, talk about it, but it doesn't exist yet. It's clear that it's, it's certainly generating a lot of income to, for someone. And it will, <laughs> it, and, uh, and it will exist. I mean, there's it's too good of an idea and too good of an application. And it's based on this academic work. Uh, so what are some applications? Medical record leakage, of course, currency, transparency in record keeping, accountability. This is about the surveillance that I talked about before, that there's um, uh, also a way that, uh, that blockchains are actually, uh, could play a role there. All right, so uh, another thing that happened with these blockchains, which is sort of ties me to the rest of the, to the day, uh, is that uh, because there's such an interest in blockchains, it's sort of an opportunity to take all these cryptographic techniques that we've generated over the last 30, 40 years and to make sure that people pay attention. They're saying, you like blockchains, let me tell you what you can do with blockchains, and this is something we knew how to do 30 years earlier. And uh, regardless of what this perverse mode of thinking, <laughs> it's a good outcome. Um, so for example, uh, okay, so for example, so uh, these days, so this is almost the end of my talk. So I talked about almost everything that was on my first outline, but I didn't talk about one of the middle, which is this idea of multi-party computation and homomorphic encryption. So these days, we're not just uh, doing encryption or authentication or uh, let's say blockchains, but one of the thing, one of the big story, the big story is data, right? That there's all this data out there, and using all this data, we can do analytics, you know, we can do uh, threat prediction, we can do better infrastructure, and so forth. Okay, and um, part of you know the premise of this is that essentially people are storing or 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 accidentally storing because you use your apps and they, somebody collects information on you, is that all this information is going to some third party. So I want to think of this, the picture is just a cloud. So there's unprecedented collection of private data. And that's a wonderful thing in terms of utility for lots of, lots of, uh, lots of um, areas. Health, financial market, traffic rerouting, smart energy use, speech and, and vision recognition. And often this requires very, very large data sets. So maybe Google has them all, but sometimes we want to share data sets. So large records are supposed to be better, and in most applications they are. There's some problem here is how do we incentivize people to share data sets, and how do we take advantage of data of individuals without actually finding out their data? 
And this is really the problem where, uh, that can be addressed if everybody sends everybody else their data. But again, as you know, if you hold somebody's data and then you're broken into, you're liable. It's a toxic asset in some sense. So there is this balance between the utility we can get out of data and the liability from holding data. And this all is really being uh, addressed by uh, math again. Math that was developed to some extent in the 80s and is being improved these days. So what are some techniques? Something called secure multi-party computation from the 80s, homomorphic encryption that uh, Daniela mentioned from 2008. And uh, by, it started with Gentry, who was a graduate student at Stanford then, and searchable encryption, which is a, much, a somewhat later invention. Uh, all of these things can be done. These two things are really lattice-based, uh, whereas the first uh, secure multi-party computation is something much, much older before the lattices. Uh, and uh, just really a few more slides. The idea here in, is, a, is a picture, is this data stored in many different places. They all want to compute a function on it. The function could be analytics, could be rerouting traffic if each one of them is a car, driving places but they don't trust each other, and they want to be able to get, come up with the conclusions without telling each other the data. And the theorem says that it can be done. And it can be done either if these two can communicate in complete privacy, or, a, so think about it, it can be done if factoring is hard, or if uh, learning with errors is hard, if we want quantum resistance. So if some problems are hard to crack, you can do this. You can compute on an aggregate of data without revealing each other the data. And what is this, what is this good for? So let's, uh, let me skip the technology. Uh, there's also standardization of some of this stuff. So here are some applications that people have already used it for, and some applications maybe people could use it for. So in terms of financial markets, people, it's been used for auctions. This is in Denmark, doing sugar beets auction. This is the most amazing story. For some reason in Denmark, I don't know why, but these people who, who, who want to sell sugar beets uh, are very technologically advanced, and they don't want to, and they want to do this in a way that's multi-party computation, where people don't know what each other's price uh, bid is. And there's a, it is really because there are this this company, which is a bunch of very smart cryptographers, uh, in Denmark, and then in Estonia is another place, uh, that have offered this technology, and their people are entrepreneurial enough to say, well, you know what, there's this technology, let's try it out for a market clearing house, like match uh, incoming orders with uh, prices from uh, trade, from different traders, for credit rating of customers, uh, for coming up with benchmarks and to see whether you are above or below uh, a benchmark. And how do you come up with a benchmark? You have uh, information from an, uh, multiple of parties and you compute, let's say, an average or something. Then you compare yourself to the average. Uh, and also another application that the Estonian Tax and Customs Board is done is for VAT tax. Because in VAT tax, you know, there's what comes in should equal to what comes out, and, so, and they have to check that that's in fact uh, the case. So this is in terms of financial markets. If people are going to be interested, these slides are going to be available. And actually this slide is uh, thanks to Mayank, who is a professor in BU, and um, the next three slides are actually from him. Uh, another place that this was deployed is, uh, de uh, or at least there's a proposal for deployment, uh, is for electricity markets where let's say there's a bunch of um, dealers and uh, people who offer electricity and, people, and a bunch of uh, consumers. And uh, the consumers, let's say, don't want to uh, say how much they consume. The, the people who are offering the electricity are sort of competing for, with each other in order to make sure that they will be chosen in order to provide the electricity. So there's many parties here, and they've, deplo uh, they've uh, proposed a multi-party computation solution which preserves privacy for local electricity trading. Uh, so this is a system that's built. Another place which is automation, which is very, very different, is a proposal of to use multi-party computation to avoid satellite collisions. So it seems, again, kind of far out there, but apparently is interest from the government for this. So let's say there are sat satellites by different governments, and they are you know, in space, and they don't want to tell each other where the locations <coughs> are, but they want to make sure that they don't collide. So, they won't, so their inputs are where the locations are, the output is where to go in such a way that you don't uh, collide. And there's a paper on this as well. Um, about how to avoid collision. What's another example is map routing. So there's another automation, is how do you get the shortest uh, path in such a way that uh, takes into account the traffic, but doesn't, um, people tell where you, they're at, but they don't necessarily, so that you could benefit and get the shortest path, but they don't want you to figure out exactly how you're driving. So there's another system that was proposed for that, privacy preserving shortest path computation. Another place is in medical. 
so this is not really, in my opinion, being used yet, but obviously will. And that is where you have medical expertise, say, some hospital that has developed a, a model for diagnosis based on a lot of patient information. They're not supposed to give patient information. They might not even supposed to give the model because you could maybe reverse patient information. But there are patients, let's say, in rural hospitals with with MRIs, with scans, with whatever, and they want to be able to use the model. So there's a clear question here of uh, both sides have security concerns. They want to hide the model. They want to hide the data. How can they interact sort of to satisfy both security concerns? So this is a two-party computation, which is sort of a special case, in fact, the first case of multi-party computation. And in the, some original paper with uh, Raluca Pupa, who's also a professor here, and others, we showed how to do this for simple learning models, not for neural nets uh, efficiently using some building blocks from cryptography. And uh, then there's a recent paper by, there's a bunch of papers, but this is a particular paper that I like by Vinod Vekuntanathan, uh, Shirag, uh, and uh, Anantha Chakazandar, uh, probably mispronouncing the name. But in any case, where they show how to do this for neural nets. So they get performance, which is not bad, for how to solve that hospital and patient problem where the model is uh, a neural net. Ah, you've come back. OK, so in any case, <laughs> see, uh, I think I don't see. OK, and then uh, <laughs> another thing which I think is really being paid a lot of attention to in Google and so forth is this, uh, and this is the, from a picture from, their, from a paper from Google, is this idea of federated learning. That is, how can, let's say, Google get uh, learn from a lot of users' uh, data in such a way that they, that they update their models for text prediction, but they don't find out exactly what your input is. And there's lots of different assumptions here about what Google controls, what they know, what they don't know, how efficient it is. Again, what's the multi-party com party com computation? You can think about all the users uh, who might be doing a multi-party computation on their inputs and just give Google the output so that it can update its model. Of course, that's a huge amount of users, so you want to do it efficiently. You want to choose subsets of the users. You don't really want to do multi-party com computation. To update a model is a specific computation, and you might be able to bank on that. It's a big field, uh, very interesting. And, uh, you know, and one very interesting question is, why are they doing it anyway? I mean, is it for public relations? Is it really because they don't want to hold on to your data? I think that's a fascinating question that probably could drive probably which solutions will be adopted and not adopted. We like privacy. What? So you say. Uh, <laughs> but you are a big company. How many of you like privacy? A lot. <laughs> I can tell you how many trainings do I do like weekly on this thing. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. It's annoying a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about sort of more public good thing? Uh, so there was this, this uh, Boston thing, which is, again was for publicity, but it's a very interesting project where they wanted to talk about wage disparity. So they're s saying, are women and men getting the same average salary? And if not, uh, uh, how, what's the difference? So they convinced all these companies to go through a multi-party protocol for average salary. Now, technically, it's extremely simple. They essentially wants to add the salaries divided by the number of companies, maybe weighed by the number of employees or, or the size of the company or something. So that's a very simple computation. But to get everybody together, to send, to use the technology, to have the lawyers sign off on that this is okay, is a huge problem. And they didn't manage to do it. Um, and this was, um, you know, in the, what convinced I think these companies to do it is at the end nobody knew what their payment to women and men was. They knew what the average salary is, so they know what the ma benchmark is and whether they're above or below. And then it was up to them to act on it. So in some sense, you are providing the information, go and do what you want. And then I think that uh, Tal Rabin actually said, uh, he saw in some talk that they are now doing a Me Too kind of thing where people complain in some place, there's some, and then there is a, a secret place. And if it only goes above 10 complaints or something about a particular individual, then some mechanism is kicked into action where these people know of each other and then they can decide what to do. So this whole idea of g giving notification based on aggregate of information is an interesting idea. Uh, what's another thing that people have talked about? They've talked about educational outcomes. So, what? Does, I, don't, I don't know how many people here have children in college. I have one. Too much money. Um, <laughs> the outcome. <laughs> that is, remains to be seen. But in any case, so, uh, here the outcome is measured in terms of, uh, <laughs> of money. How much money they make after they go to college, right? And some colleges, are they more worth to go and not worth to go? What's the trade-off between how much you put in and how much you get out? And of course, the colleges don't want to give you this information. Um, so they, they, but it's a clear case for find, doing some sort of aggregate computation where you find out, uh, what, out what average salaries are later. 
And I think that there's this whole infrastructure with tax, that learning from tax records and student records to try to correlate you know, student success and, and then later uh, profit. Uh, and this is a work again, Bogdanov is from Estonia, and this is, a lot of this work is done by this company of, of his. And then as I mentioned before, there's the surveillance thing where we kind of use the court structure. This is a paper with some students at MIT uh, where we use the fact that in the court system, there's all these federal judges. There might be lots of them. I don't know the numbers that I've heard, 800 or something. But there's only 12 district court, and you can sort of utilize this hierarchical uh, structure to um, have the judges report only something, some share of what they do to these uh, 12 district courts and then the 12 district court do a multi-party computation based on which they can release statistics. How many wiretaps are really out there? How many wiretaps are for crime, white collar crime, pornography crime, whatever crimes people do, and are they effective? Because one interesting question is that when the FBI comes and says they want your keys, you know, an unreasonable question is to say, okay, based on surveillance, how many convictions have you had? And often they, this is an answer that either they claim they don't know or they don't want to answer, because I don't think it's that many. But it would be interesting to find out Yes, um, and this is the kind of statistics that you might be able to collect. Finally, maybe international cooperation, you know, some platform, you know, the missing plane. If everybody got together and gave all their satellite information, maybe there would be a better effort, a faster effort to find coordinates. So I think that's uh, all I want to say, except the punchline is that investing in basic research is a good idea. And, uh, and, the, com and the argument is really the story that I just told that you know, if you think about RSA and sort of the basic research in 76, where would we be today if we didn't invest in it, okay? Uh, where we'll be, um, you know, and, and going ahead, uh, where are we gonna be, you know, 2050 if we don't invest in research today? I think the question is that we don't wanna find out. So. Okay, thank you. So I'm not going to take any questions. We have a reception upstairs. No, it's outside. Outside, outside, even better. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming.